Hey everybody and welcome back to Jim's Garage. Hopefully by now you've seen my last video where I spoke about all the parts I'm going to use in this build here. Now for this build I had some interesting constraints because it's not going to be for me. It's for a family member and I had a few things that I had to stick to such as a budget of about £500. I wanted ECC memory because this is going to be used to store some valuable possessions, photos etc. It needed to be power efficient because it's going to be a NAS that's on all the time and I wanted it to have an iGPU because I wanted simple remote maintenance for the person that's going to have this. I'm actually going to do most of the management through something like WireGuard or HeadScale and I'll come on to that in the future. But for this video I just wanted to show you how I put this together. Now I'm not going to insult your intelligence and show you how to turn a screwdriver but I am going to walk through some of the components and what I thought about this build process. So here you can see quite obviously I've got the PSU. This is just the CX550. It's a bronze power supply by Corsair. I've used Corsair for years because they've never broken on me. They've got a good warranty and a decent RMA process. That's simply plugged into the motherboard here and the header over here for the CPU both of which are pretty standard and is pretty much in the same place you would expect. Remember, this is a consumer motherboard. It's the ASRock B550M Pro 4. And due to that, it's got a consumer layout. So typically on a server motherboard or workstation, you would have different orientations for the RAM and CPU cooler because you'd probably have this in a 1U, 2U rack, etc., where the airflow would be different to a case. I'm going to be putting this in a standard micro ATX case. I'll come on to that later in the video. So for building this thing, it was actually a doddle. And I was a little bit worried because this is my first AMD build. And the processor socket is a little bit different to what I'm used to. When I first got this motherboard, I actually thought, hey, where's the funky little clasp like you have on an Intel where you put the CPU in, you put the metal bracket, you pull the lever and it locks it in. AMD didn't have that and I thought there was something missing in the box. But actually you put the pins into the socket and then there's a very small little slider that just hooks onto the bottom lip of the chip and that held it in place. Once I got that in place I put the Noctua on and this is the, D, this is the NH-D9L. This is probably a bit premium for this build but like I said this is going to be out in the field. I'm not going to be present pretty much any of that time to fix things should they go wrong. So I love Noctua stuff, I use it in all my builds and I know that I can confidently put this out in the field and the chances of anything going wrong are really slim. Also bear in mind that this is a 65 watt TDP CPU and for its intended use purposes, predominantly a NAS, it will barely be drawing any power. I've already drawn earlier because this is installed with Windows 11 and I'll show that up in a minute. It only draws about 23 to 24 watts of power on idle and that's with things like the iGPU driving the Windows desktop and a couple of USB devices plugged in. So I imagine if this is running something like Proxmox or TrueNAS where there'll be no iGPU, probably no keyboard and mouse and probably with a few BIOS tweaks as well, we can probably save a few extra watts. I'll give you all of those details in later videos. The RAM on this thing is just the ECC memory from what I said in the last video. It's the Kingston server memory. It's 2666 megahertz. It's a CL of 19, I believe, and it's two 8 gigabyte sticks. You could obviously go bigger if you wanted. Like I said, I think this is a great foundation for an entry home lab or entry NAS, and even to combine that because you've got the iGPU, you've got the ECC memory, you've got pretty much everything you need to get this started. So on top of that, I've simply got an M.2 in here. I actually chose to go for the Crucial P3 Plus instead of the MX500, and I've actually ordered a second one to go in this NVMe slot here, just so that then I can mirror the boot drive, and again, it gives me a bit of extra redundancy. If you want to keep costs down and you're going to keep this at home, obviously just make sure that you're running plenty of backups of your config, and then should disaster happen, you can fresh install and then get this back up and running. As this is out in the field, I want to give myself a bit of breathing room, so I'm going to mirror these drives. Outside of that, it was really straightforward. One thing I wanted to call out on here is you can see the massive heatsink that's over the VRMs, etc. 
That was one of the draws to this board as well because the cooler it is, fingers crossed, hopefully the more durable it is. So other than that, this is pretty straightforward. I've also ordered an HBA that's on its way because I wanted to toy with whether I want to run Proxmox on here and then create a true NAS virtual machine. I'm still not sure what I'm going to install. It will be a toss up between true NAS, probably true NAS scale and Proxmox. Um, but in future videos, I want to show you how to virtualize true NAS anyway. So I kind of thought, let's kill two birds with one stone. So let's get into this. Let's fire it up and let's see this thing in action. But before I do so, and one wardrobe change later, plus Happy New Year everybody, here's the completed build. And this includes the additional two Iron Wolf hard drives that I mentioned in the last video. Those are down here, one on the top and one on the bottom. And the rest of the process was pretty straightforward. Now, the bit you're probably all interested in is how power efficient is this? Well, I mentioned earlier that I booted up with Windows 11 and I got about 23 watts on idle, which is pretty amazing, especially considering that this has a pass mark of 20,000. And yeah, it really goes to show that the AM4 platform and the AM5 even more so are really amazing when it comes to power efficiency. For example, I've stress tested this and it pulled something like 91 watts. That was in Windows using ID64. This gives me more performance or basically the same pass mark of 20,000 as my Dell R730, which is over there. That pulls nearly 300 watts under load. So you can see how six to seven years of development and more importantly, scaling down in nanometers has made a massive difference in terms of power efficiency. So I wanna take the rest of this video to actually see if we can improve power efficiency. So, like I said, I've got some benchmark figures for Windows and Proxmox, and now we're going to hop into the BIOS because this is still on the default. I wanted to have a benchmark of what it comes like when it's factory shipped compared to what we can do when we tweak. Now, I've done some research online with some popular YouTubers. Wolfgang's channel was pretty good because he's gone through this extensively. So I'm going to take a few tips from what he suggested. Plus, I've done some extensive reading of the manual, which nobody does, but was actually quite handy. And I've also cross-referenced that with some experience of Redditors that are using this exact same setup, or specifically the board, for their home lab. And what I've narrowed it down to, and I'm going to try a few things here, is basically tweaking the overclocking profile. Now, this might not be something you want to do if you're going to be using this as your core server, but certainly for something that's going to be a NAS that's going to be idling, you might want to have this really low power draw whilst it's just a NAS. And then in the future, if you need more horsepower, you know that you've got it under the hood and it's ready to go when you want with just a flick of the BIOS. So I'm going to jump into the BIOS now and I'm going to start configuring this thing. Hey folks, well we're now in the BIOS and I've just had a check actually and it's running at 58 watts which is really surprising. That's higher than the idle power within Windows 11. So I'm going to have to investigate and find out what's going on there. Maybe it's turboing the clocks or something, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, here you can see you can confirm that I've got the B550M Pro 4 on version 2.6, which importantly powers the brains of the operation, which is that Ryzen 5 Pro, which is how I can get the iGPU with ECC memory. And we can see here that I've got the ECC assigned to A1 and B1. That's the recommended channels as per the instructions. So now let's head into some of the OC and the advanced at the top, just to see what's going on there and see if there's anything that we can do to get this power draw down. Okay, so after a little bit of manual tweaking, I've managed to keep the frequency at 3900 MHz and drop the voltage down to 1.25 from 1.35. That's actually now dropped the wattage by about 10 watts. And also I've disabled this SOC Uncore Overclock mode, which always tried to pin the frequencies to their max value. I think that's about as far as I'm going to get in the BIOS, but what I'm really keen to do now is I'm going to install the AMD tuner on Windows and I'm going to see if I can improve this further because that will enable me to, with software through a GUI, actually change the BIOS in real time. So let's dive into Windows 11 and let's try and tweak this and see if we can improve the wattage further. 
Okay, so over in Windows, I've now got the Ryzen Master installed and I've been having a bit of a play around. So previously I had this set at 1.25 volts and as you can see here, I've managed to drop this down now to 1.2 volts. And if I apply this and do a test, I'll just tell you that at the moment, the power draw is at 42 watts. And so if I do an apply and a test, this is now spiked up and is running at 110 watts. And then hopefully this will complete without an issue. Now, this is not an extensive stress test and anytime you're doing any form of undervolting, underclocking, etc., you'll want to run this for an extended period of time. That's true for a gaming system, but more so for a server, which is going to be designed to be on all the time. However, it's less likely to be pegged at 100% like it might be within a game. So I still recommend you do this for a long time. Anyway, that test has passed once again. And now you can see that the actual power draw of the CPU will be significantly lower because I've dropped it down to 1.2 volts instead of the default of 1.35 volts. And if I wanted to play a bit more, I could probably drop down the GPU as well and get some power savings there. But I think this is a decent result given what we've got in this machine. Now, this idle power of about 40 watts, 42 watts I'm looking at at the moment, yeah, it doesn't sound amazing compared to some of the other YouTubers out there that are getting things like, I don't know, 18 to 20 watts. But the difference you've got to remember here is we've got a CPU in here with a pass mark of 20,000. So yeah, it might be a bit overkill for a NAS, but as I've said, I think this is a great solution for your all-in-one. So you could have all of your home lab, including your NAS, in this single build, and you're still going to have an extremely efficient package, which will idle around sort of the 40 watt mark. Obviously, the more drives that you're going to add into that, each one takes about five to six watts in idle, and that is dependent on the RPM of the drive. Higher RPMs will take more power. But I'm really happy with this. So what's the conclusion? Is this the most power efficient NAS you can buy? No. But that's because this thing is packing a CPU with a pass mark of 20,000. And I actually think this is better positioned as an all-in-one home lab. That's because you're going to get the iGPU, the ECC memory, plus plenty of expansion should you want to run a NAS virtualized within this appliance. And I think that's the route that I'm going to take in the next video. I'm going to install Proxmox on this thing, and then I'm going to pass through these drives with an HBA. I think that gives a really good balance of power when you need it, power efficiency when you don't, and plenty of expansion on the motherboard itself thanks to the PCIe sockets and the additional SATA connectors. I'm really excited now to start planning my future home lab around a similar setup. I think using the server grade equipment is really good, but I really want to explore what the options are with consumer grade kit given the advancements that have been made. If I can get things like an iGPU, ECC memory on each node, and bring the power consumption down without sacrificing the performance, I think that's going to be a huge win. And it's going to enable me to have something like a Kubernetes cluster split across three physical nodes with identical hardware so that hopefully I can do hardware pass through to each of the nodes and then have things like Jellyfin and Plex use those devices irrespective of where that container sits. So thanks a lot for watching everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been great fun building this and walking through some of the power saving techniques. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to virtualize TrueNAS within Proxmox using an HBA, as I know that that's something that you guys have been asking for for a while. So stay tuned, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody.